morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Living With This. I'm your host, Sharon Mundia, and we are at Park Inn by Radisson. Today's show is all about maternal health. And the first segment, I'm speaking to Dula Wambori, who's going to take us through everything we need to know about um, those, those first few moments with our babies and how to prevent um, infant death. In fact, I want to start this off with some stats for you. And that is, according to WHO, every year, nearly 41% of all under five child deaths among, are among newborn infants. Babies in their 28 days of life or the neonatal period. Um, oof, it's a little heavy to start, start off the morning, but it's so important that we have this conversation, isn't it? Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so why don't you tell us about some of the causes um, of infant death? Like, what are some of the things that, that parents should be looking out for? Lack of basic care. So we have many moms now sometimes who are like, I'll just give birth at home. Or I've got a tr traditional birth attendant. Yeah. And then they go through like prolonged labor. And they're like, I've been in labor for two days. I meet moms who are like, you know, my first child was in labor for two days. And the baby just didn't make it. Mm. And those are some of the things. So you don't have care. So this is specifically at birth. Yes. Yeah. So, and okay. so even now as we move uh, forward, yeah. sometimes you have a baby at home and everything yeah. seems okay. But they've not been checked. There's no APCA score done, so nobody knows how the baby is doing. And you're told, yeah, your baby has cried, your baby looks pink, then now you're okay to go home. Yeah. So you go home with no sort of danger signs to look for. You're like, so the baby, is the baby feeding? Do I have enough breast milk? Also, talking about breastfeeding, yeah. many moms go home and sometimes they're not sure about breastfeeding. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, I might go back to work in a month yeah. or two, so I don't need to breastfeed. And breastfeeding actually is one of the main things that prevent infant death. Why is that? The first milk the baby gets yeah. is a huge shot, like the biggest vaccine mm. they'll get. And that actually like protects them the entire time. So in fact, research has shown that colostrum is so thick, it lines the whole gut of the baby. And the baby's gut remains virgin until food is introduced or water. And that's how they say, like many women, even who are HIV positive, as long as you're exclusively breastfeeding your baby they're okay because colostrum is that powerful oh wow mm. like it, like the first it's like the first vaccination you and the hugest yeah. vaccine they'll get yeah so it's really really important because that actually supports your baby okay okay yeah. so you said lack of proper care um not breastfeeding um mm. Education a, yeah. as well. And educate. Yeah. Okay, what do you mean? By because education? when you do your prenatal visits, you're told so after the baby comes, you need to eat healthily, you need to check and see if your baby is not like overwrapped and that they're not sweating. Okay. So that now they're able to actually have enough air around yeah. them. Yeah. Many there are many myths that surround like putting your baby to lie on their tummy. Yeah. So many women now go home and they're like, Oh my mom did this, I'm going to do it as well. Okay. But you know, so lack of education actually is one of them. Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the ways that we could prevented and especially we can even focus on certain moments like let's start with like during the process of giving birth yeah what are some of the things that we could be we should be more aware of that would help prevent um, infant deaths yes so be aware of how labor starts so it starts with a few signs you know like your mucus plug coming out yeah. or getting contractions also being aware of how many weeks you are sometimes you ask moms like how far along are you yeah. like for example my help I'm like I was asking her a while ago when she was pregnant like yeah. so how many weeks are you she's like mm, I've been thinking about four months so she has no idea so preterm labor yeah. leads to infant mortality because then they're not born in a hospital setup they're not being able to support their breathing and all those things so if they don't even know how many weeks they are yeah. then it doesn't actually help so preterm labor is is really big so you need to know when you're going into labor okay. and how many weeks you are so that yeah. you know if it's okay to be in labor or if it's preterm oh, labor. Oh, if it's urgent. Yeah, yes. so it's like ding, ding, ding. Okay, yes. and then during the process of giving birth, what are some of the things that we could we sh could help um, mm. prevent? That um, I feel like most women need to know how long the contractions are lasting. Sometimes okay. they start like start stop, but yeah. once they become regular, and if they tend to stop in between, yeah. ask yourself what's going on with my body. Is my baby playing? Yeah. Because even during labor, your baby moves, so you are aware of the baby's movements. So even during the bath itself, be aware of your baby's movements. 
Right. So like when when did you last feel them kick? Yes. Yeah. And like my labor started last night, but yeah. the baby has been playing and they're okay. Uh. Or also be aware of your water breaking. What color is it? If it's green, then your baby might be in distress. Right. So you know then this is an emergency because you need to meconia. go to hospital. Is it called meconia? Yeah, meconia. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to know like I need to go to hospital now yeah. because I need to monitor my baby's heart rate. Right. So it's also some of the things people don't really consider and giving birth at a health care clinic or giving birth with a medical profession. Right. So it, it means you can also have a home birth, yes. but you need to have a certified midwife. Right. And the right support at home. Right. Yeah. Okay. Because they know how to check your baby's heart rate. Yeah. They know what they're looking for. Yeah. They'll check and see the baby's head is positioned well. Yeah. Because you can have a prolonged labor and the baby's actually breech, meaning they're coming with their legs or their bum. Yeah. So the chances of actually having a successful birth yeah. tends to be minimized by that. Okay. Yeah. And let's talk about um once you bring the baby home, mm. what are some of the things that we should be aware of that should, could prevent death? Yes, so look at uh, the baby's environment. Mm. So like now we've got small Moses baskets that have all these frills everywhere around them. Yeah. And those are some of the things that make the baby suffocate. So give the baby enough air. If you're living like in a one room house, yeah. try and like cook outside because now the smoke also affects like the baby's breathing and all those things. Right. Remember to wash yeah. your hands before you get in contact with the baby. Many moms change the baby's diaper and then they just go ahead and like think like they can just breastfeed them and they didn't wash their hands or sanitize their hands. Yeah. That also uh, creates an area of um, infection. Okay. Take care of the umbilical cord. If you're in a dirty environment, then actually all that gets infected. Mm -hmm. So you take your baby home, think about the baby's environment. Like what does the baby need? If I'm yeah. going to do bottles and like I'm going to give the formula, are the bottles sterilized? And are the people handling all these things? Have they washed their hands? Is the water um, uh, clean? You know, like look at the baby's environment because most of the time people go home and sometimes you're told like, you know, for example, your milk hasn't come in. Mm. So you go home and for two days you're just struggling with milk. You're not asking for help. You're not saying, I don't think I have enough milk. The baby's crying, but you're determined to continue doing it. And that's always awesome. But sometimes babies do get dehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. There are times you meet with the moms <laughs> and their babies are just swaddled and swaddled and swaddled. And you're like, excuse me. Yeah. Like you're suffocating your baby. Yeah. And that's one of the things people overlook, especially here. Or hitting the room and sleeping with the heater on okay, and the, the okay. room is too hot. Yeah, you talked a, a little bit about like, you know, washing hands. Um, I remember hearing someone saying that they don't really care if people wash their hands mm. before holding their baby because maybe a little bit of germs is, is good for them. Mm. Is, thoughts no. on that? No. So the germs in your home, mm. the baby adapts to them very quickly. And not say babies go home and they just keep sneezing and sneezing and sneezing. They're opening mm. their lungs, but they're also getting used to germs that are in their environment. Okay. But you can imagine if I have cold yeah. and it's very hard to hold a baby like this. People hold the baby and they're like, oh, I'll touch their hands and I'll touch their nose. And you're just transferring all oh. that infection to the baby. Yeah. I don't know if you saw in social media about this baby who died from a kiss. Because somebody who had like um, the cold sore kissed the baby, it went and became an angitis. And so you can imagine like that's an extreme case. Yeah. But even for you and I, if we sneeze or we touch a trolley and it <sighs> had, some, somebody had a cold, yeah. then you know, we pass it on to the baby. Yeah. Mm. Um, now let's talk about prenatal appointments. Can you break mm. down what that looks like and why it's important for, for mothers to um, it's so important yeah. and I always say when you discover you're pregnant yeah. visit a healthcare professional or go to a clinic because that way you first start by getting um, the vitamins that are important the government hospitals now are giving IFAS and they've got iron they've got folic acid and they help like you yourself sustain the pregnancy with the iron it also helps your baby develop quite well even with the brain when you go there they normally ask you the first question they ask you is when was your last menstrual period okay so they're able to calculate for you your day right yeah then you know how far along you are yeah so prenatal visits yeah. are extremely important because none of the support you from there yeah. Then they tell you when to go back next. And in every time you visit, if you visit every six weeks or every month, they normally tell you, so now at week 15, the thing we want you to do is start moving, like exercising, or you need to now change your diet. You need to up now your iron uh, food, yeah. or you need to reduce your carbohydrates. Maybe you're putting on a bit too much weight. They're watching out for all those things. Go out in the sun. Do you know research has shown that many working, no mom, uh, many babies now in Kenya are actually being born uh, vitamin D deficient yeah. because we've got many working moms who just drive, yeah. enter the office, 
come back like that so they never get sun right. so they you get advice like that you need to be out in the sun try and take a lunchtime walk yeah so mm -hmm. don't take it for granted you. as like no. yeah and and have you found that maybe with moms the second time over maybe they're having a second or third or fourth child mm. that um that they're a little bit more relaxed but okay. and is that okay maybe because they know yeah but i think like the first visit is always important because yeah. it sets the pace for yeah. the remaining of the time i mean the times you i know for sure you can feel like oh i'll yeah. just go to hospital yeah. They'll do my blood pressure, me. they'll yeah. do the deep take, you know, and then they'll tell me, you're fine, yeah. go home. Yeah. But I feel like you need to do visits at certain times. Like you have to do the 18 week or 20 week visit because that's when they do the scan and see how your baby is growing. Right. The anomaly scan is really important. Then after that, the last scan checks how the baby is positioned and whether the cord is around the neck. So you know how your labor is going to be. Yeah. yeah so even if you choose not to go every single month, I mean, it's not available for everyone, yeah. but you need to really go for education and know what's going on with your body you know sometimes like i support women at the karura clinic yeah. and sometimes they come and they're like yeah it's so weird like i've been feeling like i'm putting on weight but they don't realize they're retaining water okay and you're like no this weight gain yeah is not normal because yeah. now from the prenatal card yeah they look at it and they're like um so you've put on 10 kilos in two months like that's not okay and right. so they're able to tell you actually you're retaining water okay. and this is what you need yeah to do. so don't take it for granted don't take even it for if granted. you're second third time mom you even know, fifth yeah <laughs> you do need just go <laughs> for the go. checks yeah um so once the baby is born how how often should you take the let's talk about maybe the first two months um, what's the doctor's visit schedule like? Yeah. How often should they go? So once the baby is born, yeah. the first visit to the doctor is at 10 to 11 days. Okay. So they want to see the baby and see if the baby is actually like regained the birth weight okay. or if they're feeding quite okay. When so, you say regained the birth weight, what do you mean? So when the baby is born, yeah. most babies lose 10% of their birth weight uh. because they also like have quite a bit of water in them. Okay. So like now you might, your baby might be born at 2.6 kilos yeah. and when you're going home, your baby is 2.44 okay. kilos. Okay. And so they're looking at seeing has the baby even gone to 2.5 yeah. because at least the baby should put on roughly 27 grams per day moving up. So they're trying to see how is the baby doing. After that, then you need to go back for your six week visit so that you can get the vaccinations okay. and everything. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Let's talk about um, SIDS, sudden infant um, death syndrome. Death syndrome. Mm. Um, and that's specific to sleeping, isn't mm. it? Um, which is such a huge fear for, <sighs> for many mothers. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of parents have lost their children. What are some of the things that will lead to the baby Yeah, passing? so a lot of research has been done into seeds and there are very many theories, mm -hmm. but it's not really known mm. why babies die. It's also called um, the crib syndrome, or the crib death syndrome, yeah. because most babies do die in their crib. Yeah. And one of the theories they have is um, sometimes you have a baby who the part of the brain that controls the breathing mm. and um, hearing has not fully developed mm. and therefore the baby doesn't hear or like the breathing is actually reduced mm. and because they can't be startled mm. then basically they actually just die peacefully in their sleep. So there's also the other theory where they say sometimes like when you have an ear, nose, throat, like infection. Yeah, yeah. So it's still the same thing with the brain. So yeah. their breathing is actually like brought down, like yeah. it's reduced significantly yeah. and they don't hear anything. And therefore, how does anyone prevent that? Mm. Especially if it's something that seems that can be quite abstract. I know some of it is because of sleeping itself. You know, mm. maybe they're covered, the blanket is on top. Yes. Um, Not having enough air in the room. Right. We also have, as I said before, like the Moses baskets that have yeah. so many things or like coat bumpers yeah. that have quite many. They right. prevent air from circulating because the babies do need air to pass through yeah. the thing. The other thing is having like a mattress that's not soft. So what's happened, um, I did that as well at the mm. beginning. Mm. Like you have a play playpen okay. and then you put your baby to sleep in the playpen because yeah. then most of us have like big coats yeah. because you want it to last longer. Yeah. So you're like, ah, this may not fit in my room. Yeah. So I'll put the playpen and then I'll put the baby in. Yeah. But the recommendation is you do need to put a firm mattress in all their cribs. If it's a Moses basket, if it's a crib, okay. if it's a bassinet, Why the mattress it? has to be firm. Yeah. Because what happens, most babies now, like if you're sleeping in the um, playpen and the mattress is soft, mm -hmm. the baby now sinks in. 
Uh, so that actually now prevents them from breathing oh, well. Wow. So the mattress has to be found. Yeah. They do have to lie on their back okay. and therefore now be able to, their airway has to be like fully open. Okay. The other thing I tend to recommend is for moms to try and elevate the mattress slightly. If you go to hospitals, yeah. all of them, the babies actually sleep elevated. Their heads are put up. Have you noticed like the cribs in the hospitals? Oh, okay. Babies are slightly slanted. Yeah, slightly. Yes. Yeah. So it's the same thing. At home, you can put something under the mattress, like a hand towel. Okay. So that there's a gradual okay. slope. So that also prevents baby from choking. The babies who feed and feed and feed and feed and feed. And because their digestive system is slightly mature, the milk tends to come up yeah. and down. Up. Right. So sometimes when they're elevated, like they're slightly okay. slanted, everything yeah. stays down. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts on co-sleeping? I think... It's doable, especially with breastfeeding. Mm. Sometimes, especially during growth spurts, you mm. feel like all you've done all night is breastfeed. Yeah. We do have really good beds now. Like I've yeah. seen many cots now that one side falls off yeah. and it's actually attached to the beds. Right. So you're able to feed and push the baby away. Yeah. The thing I don't really advocate for is for the baby sleeping between the partners. Okay. Even all of you facing each other and breathing sometimes does not create that good air yeah. over the baby. So even for people who don't have that crib, most yeah. of the thing where they prefer is for the baby to sleep at the end, both of them are sleeping at one corner okay. together. Okay. So you find dad saying, oh my God, like I'm just sleeping barely on the bed. <laughs> Go to <laughs> but, the couch. Yeah, yeah, as in them, yeah. like their options. <laughs> yeah, so, it's fine. Yeah. It's fine. So the baby doesn't sleep in the middle of them, yeah. but sleeps breastfeeding. So it actually makes the mom have a bit more sleep and yeah. for the baby to get the nutrition they require. Right. Mm. Okay. So it's not an absolute no-no. No. Okay. I wouldn't say it's a no, especially for moms who okay. are really trying to breastfeed. Okay. And if you can get that co sleeping cot where you just... Yeah. Yes. push the baby yeah. further away from you yeah. and then you're confident the baby's actually sleeping okay. yeah and that you also are okay to, mm. to move even to fall asleep like oh, to fall asleep. yeah because yeah. the you're truth like, is you're not 100 yes. percent every two seconds you're like <gasps> yeah what happened and okay the fast asleep. okay mm. <laughs> okay well thank you for that we've got uh another segment lined up for you with um do the one boy and this one has to do with your hospital bag. What should be in your hospital bag, ladies? Uh, we'll be right back in a moment. <laughs> 